2 Samuel chapter 6, the Bible says, Then David again gathered all the elite troops in Israel, 3,000 in all, and he led them to Bala of Judah to bring back the ark of God, which bears the name of the Lord of the heavens, of all, heavens armies, who is enthroned up between the cherubim. And they placed the ark of God on a new cart, say new cart, and brought it to Abinadab's house, which was on a hill. Uzzah and Ahio, Ahio Abinadab's sons, were guiding the cart that corrected, uh, that carried the ark of God. Ahio walked in front of the ark. David and all the people of Israel were celebrating before the Lord, singing songs and playing all kinds of musical instruments, lyrics, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. But when they arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled and Uzzah reached out his hand and steadied the ark of God. Watch this. Then the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah and God struck him dead because of this. So Uzzah died right there beside the ark of God. I'm having some uh, ringing in the microphone if you could take care of that. David was angry because the Lord's anger had bursted out against Uzzah. He named that place Perez Uzzah, which means to burst out against Uzzah, as it is still called today. David was now afraid of the Lord, and he asked, How can I ever bring the ark of the Lord back into my care? So David decided not to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom of Gath. Watch this. The ark of the Lord remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months. Say three months. three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his entire household. Then King David was told, The Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's household and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went there and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with a great celebration. And after the men who were carrying the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, David sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. And David danced before the Lord with all of his might, wearing a priestly garment. So David... And all the people of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts of joy and the blowing of the ram's horns. Mm. But as the ark of the Lord entered the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked down from her window. When she looked at, and when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she was filled with contempt for him. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the special tent of David, the special tent David had prepared for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. And when he had finished the sacrifices, David blessed the people in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. Then he gave to every Israelite man and woman in the crowd a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, a cake of raisins, then all the people returned to their homes. If I can have some form, more form monitor, please. And when David returned home to bless his own family, Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. And she said in disgust, How distinguished the king of Israel looked today, shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any vulgar person might do. David retorted to Michal, I was dancing before the Lord, who chose me above your father and all his family. He appointed me as the leader of Israel, the people of the Lord, so I celebrate before the Lord. Yes, I am willing to look even more foolish than this, even to be humiliated in my own eyes. But those servant girls you mentioned will indeed think I am distinguished. So Michal, the daughter of Saul, remained childless throughout her entire life. So Michal, the daughter of Saul, 
remained childless her entire life. So Michal, the daughter of Saul, remained childless her entire life. Six weeks ago, I came and preached a message to you talk about, talking about beware of the little foxes because it's the little foxes that can spoil the whole vine. And at that moment, it seemed like the hordes of hell came upon your life. Family disruption. Career things messing up. Left and right, it seems like things were coming up against you. Things that you went through. Things that fell upon you. And then I preached a message two weeks ago that the reason that you were going through the hell that you were going through was because you are anointed. And then last week, I talked last week for a few moments that you are going through this because God is wanting to get the most fruit out of your life. That he wants you to be fruitful. And in order for you to be fruitful, he has to cut away. He has to get cut out the vines that are growing in between you. And cutting out the things that does not represent him. So that he can cut all the things that do not represent him out. So that all of your fruit can come forth. I began this series six weeks ago, actually eight weeks ago, two weeks before I kicked off this series, I warned you to beware of the little foxes. And instead of the little foxes, it seems like the little foxes were eating a lot of your harvest, and now the little foxes are big foxes. And they kept coming, and they kept coming, and they kept coming. More for a monitor, please. And they kept coming and coming up against you, coming up against your family, coming up against your walk, coming up against your calling, coming up against your career. And they kept coming and they kept coming. And the reason why they kept coming was one, is because you are anointed. And number two, some of the things that were happening in your life had nothing to do with the foxes. It had all the things to do with God. And God in His garden of your life wanted to cut some stuff out because he wasn't happy with the fruit that you were bearing. So he wanted to get more fruit out of your life. And he wasn't happy with just more fruit. He kept cutting and kept cutting and kept cutting away until he got much fruit out of your life. This has not been a season for you that you will remember for all the good things that happened. But I believe if my prayers have been right and the things that I have been sensing from our Father, that this will be a season for you that you are going through, that you are experiencing, that you will remember because this is a season that God has placed you on the potter's wheel to create a, something out of you that was a mess going around and around and around on the potter's wheel. And now he has created you. He is forming you. He's got you right in between his hands so that he can cre create a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful piece of, 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 of pottery to use you. To use you for his glory. I love characters of the Bible. I love reading about the biographies and books. My library is filled with books uh, uh, of characters and life stories of people that go through the Bible. And David is one of my favorite ones, though a lot of it is, is being told and books have been written about his life. That this, this part of the passage of 2 Samuel 6 includes a couple of people that I want to introduce you this morning. And I'll talk about them later. One is Obed-Edom. Number two is his wife, David's wife, Michal. And though a lot is talked about Michael, there is a man in this passage right here that I'm going to bring out that only a little bit is told about, but I want to share a lot because he did something that I believe that we can learn from that will absolutely revolutionize our life when it comes to the presence of God. But I love reading about the story of Michael. It's not a pretty story. It's a messy story. But I'm 
to this point in his life, my, uh, David is first introduced to the world as a shepherd boy. David, being a shepherd boy, being the, 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 the dirtiest job that there was at the time. If Mike Rowe did a television show at this time in Israel, he would have done, uh, went out into the fields of shepherd boys and shepherds that were out in the field because not only was it a dirty job, it was a stinky job, but it was a lower of the lower class job in Israel at that moment. You couldn't get any lower. But someone in David's family had to tend the sheep. So if someone has to tend the sheep, and, and Jesse had all of these boys, these strapping, strong, young, magnificent, handsome boys, then somebody's got to do it. And maybe you understand what it's like to be the baby of the family that's always got to wash the dishes, and the baby of the family that's always got to take out the trash, and always got to sweep the floor. Get David to do it. Puny. Bible said he was rooting. He's dirty in the fields of Israel. At night, sleeping on the side of one of the sheep for a pillow. Can you imagine being a shepherd, getting up smelling like sheep? Going to bed smelling like sheep? Lifting your, your hands to eat and your hands smell like the sheep that you've been petting all day. David said, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. We forget that that rod had to be filled with the smell of sheep as he prodded the sheep to go forward. It was a dirty job. There's no names among shepherds besides David. In fact, even when Jesus was born, the Bible says the shepherds came to worship him. But there's no names of the shepherds that worshiped him. Because menial jobs like that got no notoriety. And one day Samuel, the prophet Samuel, comes to the house of Jesse, directed by the Lord. With anointing oil. And tells Jesse that Jesse, one of your sons, has been set aside and anointed to become king. Jesse, being the proud father that he is, probably st stuck out his chest and said, of course, one of my boys. And called all of David's brothers out and let them go out one by one. And each one came up and stood before Samuel. And Samuel looked at these strapping young boys, strong men, fighting men, strong men, warriors, strong men, and one by one, Samuel went down the line. Yes, he is strong. Yes, he is good in appearance. But no, he's not the one. Yes, he is strong. Yes, he's handsome. But that's not the one. Jesse, is this all the boys that you have? And even Jesse downplayed it if you read the story that yeah, I got this boy. He didn't even bring him to the, to the presentation. He didn't even bring him to the coronation. Yes, I got this boy, but he's out there in the desert, in the wilderness, tending the sheep. He hasn't taken a bath in days. You, you don't want David. David's a shepherd boy. Now bring him to me. I want to see him. Bring him to me. I got to meet him. I thank God. When God told Samuel that it's him that looks at the heart, not the outer appearance. David comes, small, maybe puny, maybe a weakling, comes and stands before Samuel. And God taps Samuel on the shoulder. That is the one who anointed, and that is the one that's going to be king. Samuel anoints David. To become king. Later to find out that David will become the king of Israel. That Jesus, the savior of the world, would be of the root of Jesse, coming from the lineage of David. Yet we learn that David also came, not only become a king, 
But he also became a priest in Israel. We'll see that in this story. Why would he not be king? David's history is of being out in the wilderness. Because there he was as a shepherd by himself with sheep. But you got to understand that you're back there with sheep, but you're never by yourself when you're with God. And David, being there, worshipped God. He learned how to worship the God who created the grass that his sheep ate from. He knew how to create and worship the God that was the father and the ancestors of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He knew how to worship the God that created the sun and the moon, the clouds and the rain. He knew how to worship the God that allowed the wool of his own sheep to grow and grow and grow to be sheared later to make uh, 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 tunics and to make uh, wardrobes out of it. That was the God he knew. So he was a man even at a young age after the heart of God who knew what it was like to worship in all of his filth and in all of his mess. On the backside of a desert, on the backside of a wilderness, to know how to worship God when nobody was there around. I'm pretty sure in this story of 2 Samuel chapter 6, we look at a man who lost his mind, but I bet you it wasn't the first time he lost his mind. I bet you it was just as the sheep sitting there looking at him. In the backside of a wilderness, he was losing his mind every time he thought about the goodness of the Lord. Every time he thought about, God, I thank you for what you created me. God, I thank you for these sheep, that these sheep are multiplying. And God, I worship you and I adore you. I thank you, God, that you are my wealth. You are my increase. And as these sheep prosper, as they, as they uh, mate and as they reproduce, God, that's just more wealth that you're bringing about. Father, bless my sheep business. I've got to impress my earthly father. But if I impress my earthly father, then God, I know that I'm impressing you. Then God, I'm going to be steadfast knowing that you are my God. I will know you. I will worship you. I will honor you. I will lift you up. And when there was only sheep and an audience of one, he knew how to worship. He knew how to worship God. No one taught him. He didn't have to go to church to learn it. He didn't look at the person left next to him and learn how to raise your hand. He didn't know how to clap. He didn't learn from somebody how to stomp your feet on a hardwood floor. And in all the church, he didn't know how to do all that. All he had was a staff and some sheep. With everything, his heart, his mind, his soul, and his being, learned how to worship God there in the wilderness. Do I got any folks that know how to worship God in the wilderness in here? Do I know anybody that's been in a wilderness situation when there was nobody, no titles, no name for yourself, nobody knew you, but it was just you and God? And that was okay because all I needed was God. All I needed was somebody who could just walk with me and talk with me. I didn't need nobody else. As long as I got King Jesus, as long as I can worship him, as long as I can praise him, as long as I know that he's right beside me, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that I will fear no evil because I know that you are with me. That I just want to know that I got God where I'm at. I just want to know that God is with me. Him, I live, I move, and I have my being. Folks can walk out of my life. See, I was an only child. I know what it's like to be by myself. Now, I feel bad for my wife that I was an only child, but when I was an only child, I had to make friends with myself. I had to love myself. I had to walk by myself, eat by myself, and on top of that, I was a latchkey kid. And so when I came from home, it was me, Tom, and Jerry, and God. And so I knew how to depend on God, even at an early age. I learned how to pray all by myself. The report cards were coming out the next day. God, please don't let me get it out. Please God, don't let me get it out this time. See, back then, parents knew how to discipline children. See, it wasn't a two-day discipline. They put me out for six weeks till the next report card came. But when nobody was in the house and nobody was there to play with me, I had to learn how to play by myself. So when I stepped into being a saint of God, a child of God, and, and, and become his son, it was okay when friends left me. It was okay if you didn't want to worship with me. Because I worship all my, by myself. When I grew up, I knew how to play by myself. I was my best friend, so all I had to do was I, I had somebody else to play with. Somebody else to talk 
to, somebody else to hang out with. And so there was David, not only the youngest, but treated like an only child. Kicked out of the house to go tend to the sheep. And now there is a dilemma because now David is now king. And the presence of God is in another place. And David is wanting to bring the presence of God to the Israel, to Jerusalem, the city of David. And he needs to get the presence of God from there to over here. So the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of God, the movable, boxable presence of God, David gets his servants, and they begin to put the presence of God on a cart. And they begin to move it. And David loses his mind in worship. Because his vision was to bring the presence of God back to Jerusalem. I don't got time to go there. I could preach five messages on that right there. And the priests are there, and the sons of the priests are there, and they're moving the cart, and all of a sudden, the oxen trips. The cart falls, and Uzzah goes out to lift and put his hand on the cart, and the Bible says that God got angry with him and smote him right there.
stopped and realized that the Lord was blessing his house. For three months, Obed-Edom's house was just blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed because the presence of the Lord was in his place. The presence of the Lord was in his house. Now, I don't, that's not my message, but I can I, 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 I love these little small minor characters of the Bible. A lot of people don't pay attention to, but that's one character we got to stop for just a moment. You need to get the presence of the Lord in your life. That's where the blessings of the Lord comes, is when you allow God to establish lordship over your home and over your life. Young people, you need to listen to me. You need to be careful what you're listening to. You need to be careful what you're letting in. You need to be careful what you are looking at. You need to be careful what you are worshiping. Because any other thing that you're not paying all homage to and honor to will not bring blessings upon your life. There is a good that sinks in the nostrils of God. There is a good that is not godly. I hope you hope they don't. Probably sat back and probably thought to himself, you know, David can take his time moving this out of my front yard. I, I like, like it right where he is. Yet David was in Jerusalem, in the city of David, trying to figure out, we have got to get that, that, that ark to Jerusalem. And he says, Obed-Edom has been being blessed for the last three months in his family. I have got to get that ark where it belongs. Obed-Edom studying that thing. And I don't know who came up with this. I don't know if it was David or Obed-Edom or someone who's not recorded in the Bible. But someone said, do you think the presence of God does not want to be carried on a cart no more? That it would rather rest on the shoulders of men. But somebody said, I got it. It was created to put staves or sticks through the Ark of the Covenant was created to rest on the shoulders, not the Ark, but those staves on the shoulders of men. It tells you that the presence of God cannot be boxed in, nor can it be placed on a cart. That the presence of God chooses to rest on the shoulders of men. They begin to try it out by lifting the Ark up by putting it on their shoulders. Is this going to work? David, three months before, had a man killed because of something like this. Is it going to work? I don't know, boys, but take one step. So far, so good. Anybody dead? We're going to take another step. That's two, boys. Keep going. Keep going. Three. Four. We're, we're going good. Anybody died yet? No. Obviously, God is pleased with this. God didn't want to be on a cart. God wanted to rest on our shoulders. Five. Good. 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 Take one more step. Six. Wait, wait, wait. Put it down. Put it down. What, what, what happened, David? What happened, David? What, what, what happened? Anybody die? No, but I just got to praise the Lord. Give me a bowl. Give me a goat. Because I'm going to worship God. I'm going to worship God for what he did. He gave us the wisdom on how to move it. God doesn't want to move on a cart. God wants to rest on men. Boys, pick it back up. Let's head to Jerusalem because we're going to take this baby home. And so they began walking. And as they began walking, the instruments started playing, clapping their hands, not stopping their feet, playing instruments. We're going to worship God. We're going to praise God. And David was losing his mind because the presence of the Lord that had been out of Israel, the presence of the Lord that had been out of Jerusalem was coming back home to stay. In fact, it just wasn't coming home to stay. It was coming back to the tabernacle that David was preparing for God to stay. So it's coming back to Jerusalem and entering the city gates. 
The men are carrying it on their shoulders. Carrying the presence of God back to Jerusalem. Coming through the city gates. And David loses his mind and worships with all of his mind. Worships with everything that he has in him. Worships with everything that is every here today. With all of his being. With all of his heart. If he had a or a wig, it would have fell out and fell off. I am telling you, he gave it all that he got to give his glory to God. Because the presence of God was returning back to his home place. The presence of God was turning back to the tabernacle. And his wife stood at the window. She didn't even meet. She didn't even plan to greet him. She wasn't coming out of her post on top of there. And looked at her husband. Strip his outer priestly garments off. And basically, with almost no clothes on, worship God with all of his mind. And David comes home. And the cow says, you foolish man. You are a king. You are a king. David, get it in your head. You are a king. And you acted less than a servant out there. You don't know kingship. I know kingship because my daddy was Saul. I grew up in the throne, in the, in the, in the castle. I grew up around my daddy being the king. You don't know, David, how to be a king. You look less than a servant girl. Dancing out there, waving your hands and flapping your arms and clapping your hands. and You looked stupid, David. <laughs> See, Macau was the daughter of a king. But David knew the king of kings. Macau knew the God of David. But David knew God himself personally. Macau probably grew up worshiping her father, King Saul. But David grew up worshiping the everlasting father. See, Macau knew the exploits of God through David in his life. But David knew the God who did exploits. Macau, because she condemned him, because she put him down, because she despised his worship, she remained childless till her death as a punishment appropriate to her transgression. And David was given many sons and daughters, and her sister Morale bore five sons. But Macau never achieved the great attainment of being a mother. She ended her days without the love and companionship of a husband, caring, caring for her dead sister's five children, all of whom were ultimately beheaded. Macau put down the worship, and God closed up her womb and cursed her for not bearing worship in her heart. For not having the ability to create worship within herself. All of Israel came out to worship God. All of Israel came out to honor Him because the presence of the Lord was coming back to the tabernacle. She didn't know how to worship God. She knew about Him, but she did not know Him. David, David knew God. David was the one that says, I will bless the Lord at all times, and His praise shall continually be in my mouth. David was the one that said, praise the Lord. Let everyone 
everything that has breath praise the Lord. David was the one who knew how to praise God. And so when he saw coming down that path, the presence of the Lord being restored to the tabernacle, he lost his mind. And you have been prophesied over in the Old Testament that in the latter days that God will restore the tabernacle of David. And you are the tabernacle of David. You are the tabernacle of David where the presence of the Lord abides. You are the tabernacle of David where the presence of the Lord rests on your shoulder. You are the tabernacle of David that worships God and honors God and gives him glory and give him praise. And that's why when you lose your mind, all you're doing is following right in the footsteps of a predecessor who knew how to worship God. When you give him all the glory and give him all the praise, that's how you know that you are in the presence of God. When you begin worshiping God, because I don't know about you, but all I got to do is start thinking it. I don't know about you, is all I got to do is just start thanking God. Thanking God for all that he's done for me. Thanking for my life. Thanking for I didn't lose my mind or lose my soul. Thanking God that I didn't lose my children or lose my wife. Thanking God that I didn't lose my calling. Losing for his glory. That God is the God. When I worship him and I give him glory and I give him honor and I give him praise, all of a sudden his presence wells up within me, his tabernacle that he dwells in, and I give him all the glory and all the praise. And I've come to tell you this morning, beloved, that I believe it's time for you to get ready because I believe worship and praise. You are going to bring about something in the atmosphere of your worship. And I believe this season has been a season to prepare you to give birth. All the stuff that you've gone through, the little foxes, the pain, the hurt, the anxiety, has all been setting you up because God has impregnated with you purpose. God has impregnated with you visions and dreams that only He has given you. And you have sat there and you're like, where is it at? When is it coming? Why do I feel like today is farther off than it was five months ago? I want to see the things that God has shown me. I want to see the things that God has revealed to me. That I'm tired of the little foxes spoiling the whole vine. Pastor, I know that I'm anointed. I know that I've been called. I know that I've been appointed for such a time as this. I know I'm on the potter's wheel. I know his hand is squeezing me tight. And he wants to cut out all the bad fruit and the bad attitudes and the bad thoughts and the simple actions that I've been doing so that I can produce more fruit and more fruit for him. God, I want to be open. I want to be open for you to do whatever you want to do. That I want to worship you with all of my money. I want to worship you with all that I have. I want to worship with all of my being, with all of my heart, with all of my strength. And when you worship Him and you praise Him, you watch what God does. Because He will turn that situation around. I believe you ought to get in the birth position. Because if the lack of worship will close up a womb, I believe worship and praise will open up a womb. And if you will birth forth visions and dreams will come to fruition those things that you have seen and desired and dreamed of and thought that they would never come to pass. Baby, I'm telling you, you better open up and get ready because God is ready to birth things out of you that he's shown you and revealed to you and called you to for such a time as this. God is wanting to bring it out. Like what David said, you think I look foolish now, you just wait. You just hold on. Got in her face and said, because God had, had was upon my life, you had to get rid of your own daddy. That's boldness right there, folks. 
I dare to tell that to your wife. But when the presence of the Lord comes upon your life, there's a boldness that is there. That allow you to say and do whatever is possible. To get the glory of God revealed out of not only your life, but those who are around you. So I've come here this morning to end my season. To end this series, this season to you. To tell you that I want you to get into the birth position. Because I believe all the things that you've gone through. All the pain and tears that you have shared through this series and this season. Some of you have said if 2015 is going to be like this for this first half, I don't want to go in to the second half of my year. But I believe God is bringing the best out of you. He's getting rid of all the stuff that doesn't represent Him. He's got to get it out of you. Because if He can get it out of you, then what he's going to put in you is going to be so much more that you would not, that it will blow your mind. But because you have been called to the nations, he has got to get things out of you. He's got to purge things out of you to get you ready for your tomorrow. So what I am telling you this morning is get ready to lose your mind. Get ready to bring the presence of God in your place, in your family, and in your life, and upon your ministry, and upon your life, and upon your children. Bring that presence of God because where the presence of the Lord is, the blessing is right there. You set up the, the, your house to be a house of praise, to be a house of worship. And I'm not talking about the house where you sleep in. I'm talking about this house right here. Because that's where the blessings of God flows. To be a house that God is able to dwell in. To be a house that God's able for His presence to be in. Because I am telling you that God is wanting to do great things in your life. Just like Obed-Edom. You realize this, that Obed-Edom did not do anything but sit back.